Here we're gonna look at a nice integral identity that allows us to evaluate a whole class of integrals known as Frulani integrals. So in the setup, we have f is nice, and by nice, I mean it is integrable on the interval zero to infinity, but I just wanna shorten that to nice just for room. Then the integral from zero to infinity of f of bx minus f of ax over x is equal to f of infinity minus f of zero times natural log of b over a. And of course, by f of infinity, I mean the limit as x approaches infinity of f of x. But we know by the integrability of f on that interval from zero, zero to infinity that this type of limit exists and is finite. Okay, we're gonna start off by proving an observation which will help us really streamline this proof. And that observation is if we have a function of two variables, which I'll call g, and it's g of x, y, but really it's a function of one variable evaluated at x times y, then one over x times partial g partial y is equal to one over y times partial g partial x. So let's maybe go ahead and look at the proof of this observation. And the proof of this observation is just going to use the multivariable chain rule. Okay, so let's maybe get to it. So we've got g of x comma y, so that's gonna be equal to f of u of x comma y, where u of x comma y is just the product of x and y. So that's a nice way to write it so that we have compositions. Now we'll use like a tree diagram to help us recall the multivariable chain rule. So we have G, which is in some sense is equal to F, which depends on an intermediate variable U, which depends on the two root variables X and Y. Okay, so now let's maybe get to it. So we have the partial derivative of G with respect to X. And so that means the derivative of this top variable with respect to the root variable x. So that's going to be equal to the derivative of f with respect to u. But since f is a single variable function, we can write that as f prime of u times the partial derivative of u with respect to x. But the partial derivative of u with respect to x is just y, so this gives us y times f prime of xy, where I've replaced u with xy because that's what the function is. And then similarly, if we take the branch from g down to y, we'll get something similar. So the partial of g with respect to y will be equal to f prime of u times the partial of u with respect to y, but that's gonna be equal to x times f prime of xy. But now just comparing these two equations for partial g partial x and partial g partial y shows us that we have established this formula. Okay, let's maybe get rid of this proof and we'll look at the main result. Now that we've established this observation as a tool, we're ready to prove this main result. So let's start with the integral in question. So the integral from zero to infinity of f evaluated at b times x minus f evaluated at a times x over x dx. Now I wanna look at this numerator and notice that it looks a lot like maybe the zeroth integral of a function. In other words, I can write this as the integral from zero to infinity of one over x times f of x times y evaluated from y equals a to y equals b, and then we have this dx here. But now we'll relabel this function f of x times y as a function of two variables just like we kind of set up in the observation. So I'll write it like this. Let's set g of x comma y equal to f of x times y. So really this is just a little bit of a shift in the way that we're thinking about this function as a function of two variables instead of a function of one variable. So let's maybe see, now we can write this as the integral from zero to infinity one over x times g of x, y, where we've evaluated y from a to b dx. 
Now applying the fundamental theorem of calculus to this bit that I'll underline in blue, we have the following. So it'll be the integral from zero to infinity of one over x times the integral from a to b of the partial of g with respect to y dy dx. Now we're gonna take this iterated integral and rewrite it as a double integral. So that'll be the integral from zero to infinity, the integral from a to b of one over x partial g partial y dy dx. Next, we can take what I'll underline in orange and apply the observation to it. So one over x partial g partial y is the same thing as one over y partial g partial x. So that means we have the integral from zero to infinity, the integral from a to b of one over y partial g partial x and then dy dx. Okay, nice. Next, we'll split this back into an iterated integral and change the order of integration. So that'll give us the integral from a to b of one over y times the integral from zero to infinity of the partial of g with respect to x, and then we have dx dy like that. But now we can apply the fundamental theorem of calculus part one to this bit, which I'll underline in this peach color to see that we'll have g evaluated at infinity minus g evaluated at zero. And those are x values of infinity and x values of zero. But notice that g evaluated at infinity and zero is just f evaluated at infinity and zero. So that breaks this down into f of infinity minus f of zero times the integral from a to b of one over y dy. But notice that this integral of one over y dy from a to b is very clearly this natural log of b minus a. So we've completed the proof of this identity. Okay, let's clean up the board and we'll see an application. We're gonna finish this off by using our new formula in order to evaluate an integral. And this integral comes from an integration B from Carnegie Mellon University. So looking at this, we notice that we don't quite have the right form yet. We don't have this X in the denominator of the whole thing. So maybe we could do a change of variables to put this in the right form. So let's just follow our nose and guess what the change of variables would be. Maybe we would set X equal to one over T, but that's the same thing as saying T is equal to one over X. Now we can calculate our dt component will be minus one over x squared dx. That allows us to change everything in the integral from x's to t's except perhaps the bounds of integration. But maybe we can calculate what changes in the bounds of integration as well. So as t approaches zero from above, which is what's happening in this lower bound, we see that x is approaching positive infinity. And then furthermore, as t approaches positive infinity, which is what's happening in this upper bound, we see that x approaches zero from above. So in fact, we just have flipped the bounds of integration. Okay, so let's see what we have for our integral now. So this is gonna be the integral from infinity to zero of sine of x minus one over pi times sine of pi x, and then times minus one over x squared dx. So let's start simplifying this a little bit. So perhaps the first thing that we could do is take this minus sign, change it to a plus sign, and then change the order of the bounds of integration so it goes from zero to infinity. Now it's starting to look like this a little bit more. Next, we'll take this one over x squared and split it into two pieces and save one of them to play the role of this x. So let's rewrite it using that. So we've got the integral from zero to infinity of sine of x over x minus sine of pi times x over pi times x all over x dx. And now we see that we've got this integral in the correct form and we just need to see what the parts are corresponding to these things over here. So our function f of x will be sine of x over x. Our number b will be the number one and our number a will be the number pi. And now everything checks out. 
So now that means our solution will be equal to, well, it's this f of infinity minus f of zero, but I'll rewrite that as a limit. So we have this limit as x approaches infinity of sine of x over x minus the limit as x approaches zero from above of sine of x over x. Notice we can't even really talk about f of zero here because we have a discontinuity there, but we can replace that with a limit. And all of this is multiplied by the natural log of one over pi. But now these are well-known limits. So as x goes to infinity, since sine of x is bounded, we have the denominator getting larger and larger and larger. So this is gonna trend off towards zero. And then furthermore, the limit as x goes to zero of sine x over x, that's well known to have a value of one. So that means our final answer is minus the natural log of one over pi, but we can bring that minus sign inside and reciprocate the one over pi to get the natural log of pi. And that's a good place to stop.